Every advanced society in the galaxy relies on the technology of the Protheans, an ancient species that vanished 50,000 years ago. After discovering a cache of Prothean technology on Mars in 2148, humanity is spreading to the stars, the newest interstellar species struggling to carve out its place in the greater galactic community. On the edge of colonized space, ship commander and alliance war hero David Anderson investigates the remains of a top secret military research station, smoking rooms littered with bodies and unanswered questions. Who attacked this post? And for what purpose? Where is Kaylee Sanders, the young scientist who mysteriously vanished from the base hours before her colleagues were slaughtered? Sanders is the prime suspect, but finding her creates more problems for Anderson than it solves. Partnered with a rogue alien agent he can't trust, and pursued by an assassin he can't escape, Anderson battles impossible odds on uncharted worlds to uncover a sinister conspiracy, one he won't live to tell about. Or so the enemy thinks. Doesn't take a scientist to figure out that I really like Mass Effect. <laughs> Mass Effect is, has a special place in my heart. When I was younger, I think around the, like a year before Mass Effect 3 came out, I went into GameStop and I picked up Mass Effect 2 in one of the bargain bins. I found it for cheap, it looked interesting enough, so I bought it, took it home and played it. And ever since, I have been very attached to the franchise. I, I love it. I've, I, I own almost every piece of media that Mass Effect has put out. The only, you, you can't see it from my little display earlier, but I also own Andromeda and the first Mass Effect, but they are digital editions on my PlayStation, so I can't exactly bring that out for show and tell. Uh, the only piece of Mass Effect media I don't own is that book. If those of you who know, know. Let's just say this. That book is the reason Mass Effect 3 has Kai Lang in it. The way he is. But anyways, this isn't a history lesson on your dear old YouTuber Afrodo. This is a review. A review of books. A review of Mass Effect Revelation. Now Mass Effect Revelation is a 2007 book written by Drew Carpetian. I'm not going to lie to you. Got no idea how to say that last name. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking it's Carpetian. Carpetian. It's probably Carpetian. But I apologize now because I probably will not be saying it right for most of this review. Anyways, it was released in May of 2007. And it's a prequel novel to the first game, which was released in November of 2007. So it is a true prequel. Um, it's got decent reviews as far as I could tell. It's got a 4.5 on Amazon, a 3.7 on Goodreads, and a 4.4 on Barnes & Noble. Its front cover is bland. It's bland. There's nothing to say about it. Um, it's just got Saren standing on a mostly empty background. You can kind of see a mountain behind him. The ground under him is dry and rocky. It's got no big features on it. And you can kind of see snow when you look hard enough. But that doesn't make any sense because they're not any snow planet. If anything, I would say they just took concept art from Novaria and then plopped a Saren model in front of it. There is an alternate cover that I was able to find. I'll put it right here if I can figure it out. But as you can see, there's not much that changed about it. It's just Saren with a different model and pose. This one looks like it was taken straight from the game. As you can see that his Geth arm has been added. Or Reaper arm. Whatever. His, his modifications made from Sovereign. So there's not much to say about that there. So going on to the back, the back is also fairly bland. It just has the synopsis on it. There's nothing really to catch your attention. The downside is the synopsis is also 
very misleading. So for the first, the first part of the synopsis is fine. It's when you get into the very last part that it starts to get strange. See, it says that Anderson is partnered with a rogue alien he can't trust. But he, he's not partnered with Saren at all until near the end of the book, the last section. He is pursued by an assassin he can't escape. No. As far as the alien antagonist is aware, Anderson doesn't exist. The people are chasing Kaylee Sanders and Saren. Not really Anderson. Anderson is that Alliance wild card that is there to make issues he he doesn't he he doesn't go past their radar at all so to speak anderson battled impossible odds on uncharted worlds that's also not true he, he's never on an uncharted world in this book uh except for maybe in the very first part when the attack of sedan happens but yeah he, he's never on uncharted world so, so yeah, there's just a lot of misleading here in this synopsis that you probably shouldn't get too attached to it when you open it. Um, so other than that, uh, I since I do recommend reading this book if you're a fan of the series, I'm going to leave a little time code down here where you can skip to the end where I give my general synopsis view of the book and my rating. I, I recommend that you read this book first. But if you do want to watch this review where I go more in depth in depth with the book, understandable. I know some people prefer that before reading. So, on to the review. So the first section is what I'm going to call In a Galaxy, Not So Far Away. This starts with the prologue, or let's say chapter 0, and goes to chapter 8. Now the first, the prologue, it takes place before the first contact with humanity. It takes place in a time where humanity is in the stars but hasn't met an alien race yet, at least as far as they know. We follow a historical figure from Mass Effect lore, John Grissom, as he goes to Arcturus Station, which is like the Alliance Naval Headquarters, where they train all their people and stuff. Or training grounds, I guess, and not headquarters. Um, he goes there and he's planning to give a speech. But first, he wants to meet with a number of top-ranking candidates. The first of these candidates is David Anderson, or one of the main heroes and long and mainstay from the main series. Now, Anderson is brought in, and John Grissom reveals to him that they've had first contact, and it's not going well. The alien sp alien vessels wiped out their exploration fleet, so they responded wiped out the alien vessels but then more alien vessels showed up and took over one of their colonies Shanxi Shanxi now for those of you who know this is the first contact war the beginning of it it's where the Turians and the humans met each other and through a misunderstanding ended up going to war with each other for a brief time it, not very long thankfully there was no major issues but Grissom is talking to Anderson because He's been asked what they should do, if they should respond in force to these alien attacks or try to be seek peace first. And he wants to ask Anderson because Anderson's going to be one of those people on the front lines and John Grissom won't. It's very nice. It's a good, it's a good way to characterize Grissom, but it's, it doesn't quite last. You'll see later. So Anderson, the chapter more or less concludes with Anderson saying that they should go to war because they have to show the aliens that they're not going to be pushed around. We go to eight years later after this for the next chapter. Uh, this puts the the puts the timeline squarely in twenty one sixty five CE, which takes place about eighteen years before Mass Effect one. So you get a good idea of where this takes place in the timeline. Chapters one through three follow Anderson as the EXO on the SSV Hastings, where they're responding to a distress call on Sedan, where it's revealed that they have a top secret research facility there that's been attacked. Anderson leads the ground team, much like Shepard does in the ME-1. He takes the ground team down. They find that Sedan has had, has been completely wiped out. They've, they, they manage to get all the way down to the bottom where they find out that a group of mercenaries who have burned off all identifications have slaughtered everyone in the facility and dragged them and put them in a room with explosives. 
they are able to kill the mercs but have to escape the explosive blast which anderson and hit one of his crew barely do this is i have a mild complaint here in that the crew member that barely escapes with anderson a woman named da gets a lot of characterization for this one moment after after chapter three we never see her again so the paragraph long description we got of her and the amount of time focused on her just feels pointless it feels like wasted time almost and i'm not normally one to say that but none of the other members of anderson's crew really get that characterization so it's it stands out a little more Anyways, after that, we get to chapter four, which where we meet Kaylee Sanders, someone who did survive Sedan because she'd left a couple hours before. At first, we're sort of led to believe that maybe she might be a traitor before it's revealed that no, she left because she found out that the head of the project, Dr. Xian, had been having contacts and was 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 researching something that was prohibited within Citadel space, AI research. So she broke into secure servers that she wasn't allowed to be in, took a whole bunch of evidence, and left the world to go report it. However, shortly after she left, she had second thoughts. She realized that Dr. Xian is very well connected, and she doesn't know if she would be, she would end up turning this evidence over to someone who's a good friend with him. So she, she sort of let her nerves get the better of her and went to go get drunk at a bar. While at the bar, she sees on the news about Sedan's attack. And there's this nice little scene here. I, I bring it up because of how often it would be used in opposite. Two drunker guys start hitting on her while she's watching the news. But instead of continuing to hit on her when she's when she notices the everyone in the Sedan's research base has been slaughtered, they seem genuinely they, they seem to try to genuinely make her feel better after they realize she's emotionally distressed. It's just a nice little scene. Most of the time in these kind of books or these kind of scenes, they want to take their, they want to take the hint and they would keep hitting on her, forcing her to fight back as a showcase of how much, of how much she can fight back. But anyways, I, I just wanted to bring that up. Um, with that, Kaylee Sanders quickly leaves the bar realizing something big happened where she stopped by what she thinks is an alliance military police now he's about to arrest her before she realizes that he's carrying a handgun that isn't alliance issued it's not the standard alliance issue gun so this makes her realize this isn't a alliance military police it's just someone pretending to be she's able to defeat him quickly with the advantage of surprise this is where he tr this is where Capriche Carpetian tries to showcase Kaylee Sanders combat capabilities but he probably shouldn't have uh, apart from this one scene she never really fights again she, she's more or less a damsel or she's just there I don't know so anyways we go to chapter 5 where we meet one of the main villains a Batarian named Adon now, Adon is a rich Batarian who hired the Blue Suns to attack the research base on Sedan. And he, after the Alliance military, after the fake Alliance military police failed to catch Kaylee, he realizes he needs to bring in better mercenaries. So he's hiring a Krogan battlemaster named Scar. Now, it's about this time that I, I would say, one of the things I do like about this is that it doesn't expect you to be intimately familiar with with the universe that it's in. It, it doesn't just say Turian and expect you to know what that is. It, it will describe what a Turian is, just like it'll describe what a Krogan is, or it'll describe what, it, it kind of describes a Salarian and an Asari, but it at least has the benefit of telling you. I mean, I guess for it coming out before the game, it should, but yeah. So, after that, I do like how they characterize Idan in a very subtle way. He, he's just like normal Batarians you meet throughout the game. He's haughty, he has a high opinion of him and his own species, and a low opinion of everyone else. He thinks his species is the best, and he he's more or less racist. 
However, despite that, he uses all of his wealth to covet other things that the other races have in high quality. He, he's introduced complaining that he has to wear this drab coat when he's normally wearing the finest of Asari silks. Or, and he, would, he talks about how he drinks the finest of Hanar liquors. It's just a nice little showcase that for all his bluster, he still covets what the other species consider high marks of society rather than his own species stuff. It's just a nice little thing. Uh, this chapter ends with going back to Kaylee's perspective and revealing that her father was actually John Grissom from the prologue, but they've been estranged for a very long time. With chapters 6 through 8, we go back to Anderson as he arrives on the Citadel. Now, this is... Anderson, this is where we get more or less a little bit of personal life on Anderson. In the prologue, he was... He had a fiancé. However, it's revealed that they're going through divorce proceedings right now. It's also revealed that Anderson keeps a, an apartment on the Citadel because he wants to live among aliens so he can acclimate to having them around he can start seeing them as just normal people rather than just aliens he, he wants to know how they work and stuff he, he goes to Cora's den to get drunk and this is I guess this is as good a time as any um I really like this small little stuff that they introduced throughout this book stuff that yeah, I can see why they're not in the game. That there probably would be no place to put it, and it's not important to the game itself. It's not even really important enough to put in the codex. But it is little stuff like this that, that, that just adds dimension, I guess, to the world. Things like in Citadel Space, time is told in a 20 hour loop. However, these 20 hour, every hour has 100 minutes in it. And every minute has 100 seconds. But the seconds are only about half as long as you would consider an Earth second. So Anderson figures that the time is only about a three hour difference between an Earth day and a normal Citadel day. We also learn about the galactic standard year, which is 1.09 of Earth years. And was founded with using the Turian, Salarian, and Asari average years and rounding it up. And rounding it down. Finding the median. Whatever. I'm getting caught up. So anyways, this this section ends with Anderson going to meet with Ambassador Goyle, who is currently in charge of the Alliance's ambassador program, I guess. I don't know. Diplomatic program. There we go. On the Citadel, as opposed to Udina, who we meet in Mass Effect 1. Now he meets with his captain and Goyle, who reveal that they caught Kaylee leaving about an hour before the base was hit. So they think she's the traitor. However, we already know she isn't. And they're sending Anderson alone on a solo mission to go find her. Because since the base is working on illegal AI research, they don't want her falling into enemy hands or anyone finding out what they're doing. Officially, Anderson is just going on vacation. That's pretty much where this chapter ends. This leads into the next section, chapters 8 through 16, which I call The Hunt for Sanders. And th this we start with chapters from Saren's perspective. Now, these two chapters involve him breaking up an arms, an arms deal between Turians and a human human merc group called the grim skulls that it's not important i guess before finding out that something the big blue suns are doing something big tracking down a blue suns member and then finding out what's going on but what these two chapters do really well is add a lot of depth to saren that you don't you wouldn't normally get in the first game yes yeah, saren is a good antagonist in the first game but you don't really get much about him and this book and this book really shows what he can be like especially outside of the influence of sovereign although at this point it could be argued that he's still already indoctrinated based on the events of evolution the comic book series where him and the elusive man deal with each other 
anyways um at this point we meet Sarah we it's shown how much he hates humanity as he executes one of the Turian arms dealers calling him a traitor to his species and say more or less saying the first contact war isn't over for me he also executes a one of the human mercs who survived and basically had already surrendered simply because he doesn't like him but the blue sun mark he tracks down later he also effectively tortures for hours even after he's got everything he wants because he wants to be sure he's not being lied to now there's an old adage uh, they even say it in the second game torture doesn't work but because eventually they're just going to say whatever to get the pain to stop but yeah I'll move on from there but it also does give him a slight pet the dog moment you see this blue sun mark he's in but he's in batarian now we get a lot about batarian culture in this and one such thing is that societal classes are very strictly held now the batarian mark is on one of the lower classes but since he got a ton of money he's able to go up into the higher classes and throw it around saying look at me so he goes to a high class a high class house where they go and they pay women to be nice to them all night We'll start with that. If I get fucking copyright check. Anyways. He goes there. But despite despite all his money, he realizes that pretty much everyone there still more or less thinks he's scum. So they 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 he gets really angry about this and hires a human girl on staff because she looks submissive. He doesn't he plans to just take all his anger out on her he just plans to abuse her for the time he has her and when when he thinks she came he opens the door to find Saren now Saren doesn't greet him like he expected Saren basically pops his eye out as a greeting that's not a joke um but he greets him and he shot he basically gets real angry that this blue sun's merc was gonna hire a girl just to abuse because he was angry just to torture effectively and it, it's a nice little for lack of a better word humanizing moment for Saren because even though he hates humanity he still thinks what this guy was going to do was horrible even though it was going to happen to a human girl so it's just, it's just nice Saren is actually really well summed up in this one quote here Perhaps you don't understand the full extent of Spectre authority, he said ominously. I have the legal right to take any action I deem necessary during my investigation. You're going to kill us? Kaylee exclaimed, her voice rising in shock and disbelief. I have two rules I follow, Saren explained. The first is, never kill any someone without a reason. And the second, Anderson asked, suspicious, can always find a reason to kill someone. That just sums up Saren's character very well in this story. So yeah, I just I enjoyed how they characterized Saren in this. And if you wanted to see more about Saren and how he was, I'd recommend reading this to find out. Now chapter eleven starts with Anderson arriving on Elysium as he figured out that John Grissom was actually Kaylee's father. He he found this out through looking into the file and finding out the her father was marked as unknown which in 2165 with the massive amount of dna testing they have and compulsory compulsory things like that where the mother could just say hey i want my daughter dna tested to find out who her father is he knows that whoever marked this as unknown had to do it on purpose and had to have a lot of power which eventually leads him to grissom now when he arrives we see that grissom just really does not like the limelight he purposely answers the door in only a house coat and his boxes and it's just a general grump like he gives oscar oscar the grouch a run for his money <laughs> but he he does everything in his power to be unpleasant and annoying he only invites anderson in when he has to and he afterwards he tells anderson that he sent kaylee out into the terminus systems with an old friend who runs afraid of Anderson seems to buy this and leaves, but it's revealed that Grissom was actually hiding her in a nearby closet and 
let her out and said he'll he'll be on that wild goose chase for weeks. This is also where Scar finds him. Scar breaks in and after fighting a bit with John Grissom, looks like he's about to kill the old man before Anderson comes back, revealing that he never bought that story. That was it was obvious he was lying. He he, he Anderson and Scar fight for a bit, but Scar eventually gets the better hand better hand of them despite look is being very wounded cuz he's a Krogan and Krogan take a lot to put down before Saren shows up and puts a couple bullets in Scar as well. Scar, realizing that he's officially outnumbered, decides to just book it and is able to get away. Chapter 12 is where Saren and Anderson finally meet with each other. Now, this is a small tense conversation between Saren, Kaylee, and Anderson. They they talk a bit about what was going on in Sedan. Kaylee eventually lies and says that the research that they were doing was biotics. They were trying to awaken humanity's biotic, latent biotic powers, which for those of you who don't know, space magic, we'll just leave it at that. They were, that humanity is one of the only races in the galaxy at the moment that doesn't have any biotics in it. And that would, of course, draw the attention of a Batarian who doesn't want humanity to get powers. Saren seems to buy this, leaving, but not before saying that if he finds out that either of them lied to him, he'll come back and kill them both. After he leaves, Anderson and Kaylee discuss a bit, because Anderson already knows they want researching biotics. They talk for a bit before Kaylee realizes that all the parts that they got for their AI research came from a single manufacturing plant on the Batarian planet Kamala. And they figure if they're going to find answers, they have to go there to Deton Manufacturing. The next chapter follows a bit with Saren, who reveals that he didn't buy the story, but he knows he can't actually kill anyone or torture them because he's on an Alliance world in the home of an Alliance war hero. He figures, at best, his Spectre status will be revoked if he's not killed by people who found out. And he knows someone probably called the police because of all the gunfire. He figures he, he'll have better luck just following Scar than trying to force the information out of Anders and Kaylee. This eventually does lead him back to the Tan Manufacturing. Now, when Scar gets back, it, he is told by Adon, our Batarian villain, that since Saren is now involved and he's a Spectre, they need to start covering their tracks and fast. So he sends Scar with the Blue Sun's Merc into Deton Manufacturing to destroy the whole place. We get a brief chapter following someone new called Jella, who is a Batarian woman working at Deton. Now we find out that she's basically been stealing from the company and selling it to a, to a buyer. She doesn't know this buyer is Adon himself, who is just using this to sell to the Sh Sedan project without being caught. Jella was told by the Adon to leave one of the side doors open so as far as she knows someone can sneak in and steal something during the day. However after unlocking the door Jella's nerves get the better of her and she flees to the bathroom to, to just try to calm herself. So she's in there when the mercs start walking through and killing everybody. She manages to survive because Scar thinks that another woman she was working with was her and she's able to avoid the mercs who go room to room by hiding in the vents. By the time that she she gets out and the mercs have stopped firing, she flees the building and is just barely able to clear it when the explosives go off. Now, she's heavily wounded. Saren arrives after this, after this has happened and the building has collapsed. He meets the Batarian emergency services who tell him, yeah, everyone is dead except for this one girl, Jella who is very badly injured. He sends them all away and waits. Shortly after, Anderson and Kaylee arrive. And Anderson, thinking something's up, leaves Kaylee behind in the car and goes forward. You can kind of see what I mean when I say Kaylee is just there from now on. Anyways, he's confronted by Saren, who reveals that, yeah, I know you lied, 
and you being here means that you must be working on AI research. Any plans to tell the council? He tries to bait Anderson into telling him if Kaylee's with him or if or any other information he might know. But Anderson refuses to take the bait and more or less says, if you're going to kill me, just kill me. Saren doesn't. He thinks, they think later he didn't just because he thinks someone might have been watching. But it's not confirmed. He just leaves. And this, this actually convinces Kaylee to be more honest with Anderson, revealing that the main reason she left the base was because she would suspect Dr. Xi'an was working with someone outside the base and she didn't trust him because she didn't know who to trust in the alliance since dr Xi'an has so many contacts this leads anderson to feeling betrayed but he understands forwarding the osd information that she had taken to report Xi'an to ambassador goyle to hopefully give her a leg up when the council finally learns that they were researching ai which is again illegal we also go to Saren, who goes to the hospital where Jella is. And this is just another good example with how cold Saren can be. See, despite the doctor's warnings, he wakes Jella up out of a medically induced coma and is told that he only has a limited time before the shock and pain of her wounds will kill her. Now, Saren acknowledges that the Batarians have the best medical care in the Citadel space, which is actually a nice little addition in this. And that even though the surgery is going to do a massive toll on her body and she might not survive them, if she does, Jella will effectively live a normal life. It won't even look like she's been in a fire because she'll have cloned skin grafts, she'll have <clears throat> cloned organs, and all that. So he wakes her up and he interrogates her for everything that she knows. She he, she reveals enough to, for him to make the dots that a dawn is evolved involved somehow now now this is where it starts showing how cold he is as jella's body slowly goes into shock shock starts seizing and dying and just whatever saren doesn't seem to care he just sits there twirling the medicine that could put her back to sleep in his hand as he considers what he's going to do next he thinks about how to approach it how to go about it but he does not seem to pay any mind to Jella as she violently dies next to him and when she finally passes about two or three minutes later he injects the thing into her tubes puts it in plain sight so the doctors can see that he did that and then walks out and says I'm sorry she didn't survive the questioning and leaves and it's just if you did not hate Saren you hated him now and if you don't hate him now you'll hate him later so with that, we cut back to Ambassador Goyle. The council is admonishing her and trying to lay heavy sanctions on the Alliance for what happened. But halfway into the halfway into the hearing, Ambassador Goyle realizes that the council is using this as an excuse because they're afraid of humanity. They're basically trying to install inspectors on every Alliance world to watch them. So she's able to take control of the negotiations and say, no, we're not going to do that and is able to basically bargain down to a much less severe punishment. And that's basically where section two ends. So we go on to section three, which I call the failed Spectre mission. This is what people picked up the book to read. This is the failed Spectre mission that Anderson mentions in the first game and mentions this is why he knows Saren is such a bad egg and why they don't like each other. So it starts with Ambassador Goyle going back to the Citadel Council and talking a bit. She's using this as a way to try to mend some bridges, pretending to be much more compliant and much more gracious to them. She gives them all the information off the OSD that, that she was given from Anderson. And she tries to she says that we will step back and let your Spectre handle this. But then she tries to negotiate having Anderson put along. But the council agrees after a bit and lets him. It's only after she's leaving that Goyle realizes that the council was agreeing to everything she did a little too fast. And she realizes, oh, the council wanted me to ask for all that stuff. And it's a nice little, it's a nice little addition to me. 
making the council as politically savvy as Goyle can be. It, it just shows that, yes, she did get the upper hand once. Once. And it, it just... It, it's so... It would be easy to make them seem incompetent. Especially considering the kind of way they took... The kind of approach they took in the first game. Where the council seemed to hate everything you do. Anyways... So from there, we go to chapter 17 through 18. And this is where we start with Kaylee getting evacuated by Alliance Marines. She was put on an evacuation because Anderson didn't trust her enough to keep her with him, more or less. And he knows that she needs to get off world. Now, as they're going, they get ambushed by Scar and the Blue Sundmer. They, Although they fight back, Scar is able to shoot down the frigate sent to get them. And the Alliance Marines escorting Kaylee are executed even after they surrender. Kaylee is taken captive because it's revealed that Dr. Xian wants her. Dr. Xian, by the way, was the traitor who let the Blue Suns into the Sedan research facility and was escorted out. They bombed the whole place so no one could figure out that he was missing. Now, he wants Kaylee captured because she's part of his old team and she's one of the few people who could help him with his new research. Now, after that, after she's captured, it's revealed that Saren, actually it's revealed while they're being attacked, that Saren purposely leaked their evacuation because he knew Scar would go out and attack them. And he know, he doesn't want to spend months looking for Adon's hiding place. So after Scar captures Kaylee, something he didn't expect, he follows him back to where he is. And this is what I mean when it's like, you'll hate him later. This guy just sacrificed an entire, an entire alliance team because he didn't want to spend some time looking for Adon. Later on, he and Anderson meet in a bar on Kamala. Um, they talk for a bit. Anderson finds out what Saren did and tries to hit him, but Saren so far outclasses him in terms of skill that Anderson is forced to basically surrender and say, fine, I will work with you reluctantly. And this is about where I, I do like one thing. The failed Spectre mission is not completely Saren's fault. After Anderson finds out that Kaylee has been captured, not killed, he negotiates with Saren that he wants a 30 minute head start into the facility where he will go and attempt to free Kaylee Sanders. After that, after that time has elapsed, either he's out or he's dead, but if he's out, He'll do whatever Saren says and try to stay out of his way as best as possible. And Saren seems to agree to this. I, I like this because it means that what happens later isn't 100% Saren's fault, even if he does, even if it is mostly his fault. It shows that Anderson put the Kaylee and his own personal feelings ahead of the mission, which isn't what he's supposed to be doing as a specter. And I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm just saying that it would have been so easy to just make Saren the bad guy 100% in this, and they didn't. So they get to this oil refinery that Adon is hiding in. Anderson is let go, let to go in. He sneaks through the he sneaks through the oil refinery by blending into the tent city, where most of the workers are, and slips into one of the back rooms. It's revealed that Saren only waits for 15 minutes before going in himself, despite the 30 minute agreement. And Saren basically walks in, guns down a whole bunch of innocent Batarian workers, and sets a bunch of bombs to set off a catastrophic meltdown of the refinery. He knows this because he'll know that Idan will try to call for Blue Sun's mercs to escort him out, and he'll follow those mercs to him. It just shows how cold Saren can be with others' lives when it gets in the way of his mission. So, with that, it, it actually does end up saving Anderson's life, though, as when the bombs go off, Scar, who Anderson had been fighting at that point to try to free Kaylee, was about to kill Anderson. But the explosions knocked him off his feet, and the two of them are able to get the better of Scar and then manage to escape. Now, Saren is able to find his way to Adon, using the method I said, he followed the Blue Sun escort group, where he meets Adon and Dr. Xian. He talks to them a bit, trying to figure out what they were doing, where it's revealed that 
they there's this giant alien artifact in the Perseus Veil that's orbiting a gas giant that they're trying to study. Yeah, those who know, know. Before, Saren coldly executes both of them despite their pleas for their, their lives and stuff. Eventually, they are able to leave. Uh, hundreds of workers are killed in the resulting, sla resulting molten fire, molten steel, noxious gas that swarms the area. And Anderson and Kaylee barely make it back as Saren is about to leave. For a brief moment, it seems like Saren is surprised they survived, but holding his word, saying he doesn't leave without them despite the fact he could, and lets him get into the vehicle. Now, this is where we get to the final page, the epilogue. Saren, of course, as we know, put all the blame of the failed mission onto Anderson, saying that Anderson blew the cover and forced him to basically detonate the reactors so he could finish the mission. Now... The only reason there isn't more massive political fallout for the Alliance involving this is that at, because Saren is a Spectre, his files are sealed the moment his mission is done. N this is also where we get a conclusion to a small romance subplot that was building between Anderson and Kaylee. It isn't great, but it's not terrible either. I just It's not worth mentioning, to be completely honest. Where Kaylee says that she's not ready for a relationship partially because she's being sent on another secret as secret assignment but to actually work with biotics this time and that's about where we end the book it's not much to talk about uh this book is good i like it i like it a lot but i also like the series and this is where i have to say something very unfortunate this book is good as a companion to the series, to the to ME1, but it's not good, that good by itself. Don't get me wrong, by itself it's fine. It's it's not great though. It's not good. It, you would probably read through this and think this is a really shallow plot line. The characters are mostly shallow. It's just it's not good. It it feels like it also focuses on too many minute details without specifying the bigger ones now mind you that's in a vacuum that's if you read only this book and nothing else and have not experienced anything else from the mass effect lineup uh another thing that i i don't necessarily like about this book is that carpetian violates the show don't tell rule quite a bit you'll often have characters thinking about something and something will happen and in their internal monologue they'll effectively say oh this happened because of this hmm it, it just happens too frequently to be forgivable there are a couple times where you could excuse it like Anderson noting Kaylee's survivor guilt in the hotel room but it, it like I said it just happens a little too often to be forgivable so it can be quite annoying in the end, I would probably say that this was a 7 out of 10. As a as a fan, it probably would become closer to an 8 for me. But if you only read this by itself, it's probably closer to a 5 or 6. But final rating, 7 out of 10. I recommend anyone who played Mass Effect 1 to read this. Or I recommend that if you do want to read this, play Mass Effect 1 right after. Because that's the best way to experience it. Again, as a companion. Now, don't worry though. For my next book, I'm going to start a fire. But until then, remember, this is Afrodo Reviews, and with every book is an adventure. And every adventure deserves to be had, even if it's a bad one. <laughs>